Well, a joint report by the World Health Organization in China rolls out a lab leak as the source of COVID-19. But that 124-page report, officially released today, offers little insight on the origin of the virus. Let's bring in Angela Rasmussen, Rasmussen, Georgetown Center for Global Health Science and Security Virologist. We've also got Anjali Kamlani joining in on the conversation. Uh, doctors, good to talk to you today. Uh, let me just get your take on what we have seen released from what is a WHO China joint report. D did we learn any more coming from this? And what does that say in terms of what we know about the virus, especially given the control China has had in the investigation? Well, we still don't know that much. Um, and I think that it's really actually very unreasonable for people to expect that uh, a mission that was four weeks long, two of which were spent entirely in quarantine, uh, would really yield any definitive answers in terms of the origin of this virus. What people should understand is that origin investigations typically take years, they can take decades. So this is really um, laying the groundwork, I think, for future studies that need to be done. But we did learn a little bit. Um, we, we got more information about the epidemiology uh, that, that was the epi data that was collected in China early on in the outbreak. It confirms the timeline that we understand uh, with which this virus emerged into the world, um, that, that the first cases were uh, sometime last or in fall of 2019. Um, they also did quite a bit of environmental testing, uh, ruled out the, the seafood market, the Huanan seafood market, as the site of an initial zoonotic spillover and confirmed that uh, it was a, actually a super spreading event that probably allowed the virus to take hold. I think the most important thing that this report did, though, was lay out the groundwork for what needs to be done going forward. As I mentioned, these types of investigations can take years. And so this, this does give us a clear path forward for how we should be approaching origin investigations uh, as we move into the future. Anjali here. I, I wonder, I know that we heard, you know, from the officials at the World Health Organization talk about those steps forward and a phase two uh, for discovery. I also noticed that there was a lot of uh, discussion about looking outside of China. And I just wonder, you know, there were concerns early on that there were political pressures at play. Did we see that in this report? I think that we did. Um, certainly, you know, China has an interest in saying that the pandemic did not originate within China at all. Um, and so there there is uh, and we do need to exclude the fact that, that the virus could have come from someplace else. That, I think, is really the basis for continuing to place so much credence in the so-called frozen food hypothesis uh, in which um, they've suggested that the, that the virus could be imported to China. Um, on the, the packaging of frozen foods that were exported from Europe. Um, I think that, that we still need to look into those. One thing that, that people should keep in mind is that nothing is being ruled out, including a laboratory accident, including the frozen food hypothesis. And we should investigate all of these hypotheses until we can definitively rule them out. But I do think that, that politics are at play here. And people should understand that we can't just walk into China and say, you know, we're the World Health Organization, we have a warrant, we're going to start investigating. Uh, these types of investigations need to be done collaboratively and cooperatively, so politics will always be at play. Doctor, I also wanted to get your take on a new survey uh, from the People's Vaccine Alliance, kind of looking at how long the vaccines we're seeing rolled out right now. And, and really, it seems, you know, a lot of progress is being made. But the expectations around that are that once we get those vaccines rolled out, we're going to be fine for the rest of the pandemic. But of course, globally, a lot of countries lagging the U.S. And that survey pointed to experts pointing that mutations might render those vaccines ineffective in a year or less, according to some warnings. I mean, we've seen them stand up to those variants out there relatively well. So what are your expectations in terms of new variants popping up uh, and that threat as we move farther and farther along in the vaccine rollout? Well, I, I think that it's very unlikely that we will start to see the emergence of variants that render the vaccines completely ineffective. But I do think that uh, as long as the virus continues to circulate in the global population, we will see new variants emerge and how well the vaccines stand up against them remains to be seen. That's very difficult to predict. This is why it is very important to think about vaccine rollout in terms of the global rollout and not just the rollout within certain countries, including the United States. 
here we're doing very well. And I think that uh, for most people, you know, we will be able to start relaxing restrictions and going back to to a quote unquote normal life daily, um, probably by by the trend here. But we really do need to to focus our attention abroad. Some countries have not received a single dose of vaccine. Those are the countries uh, that that we really need to make sure are getting vaccines because that's where new variants will emerge if they if they do. Dr. Rasmus, and I know you and I have talked about that very specifically, but also bringing that back to the U.S., we know that there are variants of concern that have originated here, domestic ones, um, and that has brought, uh, you know, our uh, health officials over at the White House uh, to basically plead with the American people to not lose patience and to continue uh, with their mitigation strategies with the vaccines rolling out and simultaneously the world, uh, the global vaccination efforts of being a little bit slower. Do you anticipate that, uh, you know, our life to normal uh, sort of idea, the thing that everyone has been waiting for is is farther off than, than we anticipate right now? Not at the pace that we're going uh, in terms of vaccination. And again, there's there's no indication that even our, our so-called homegrown variants or the, the B117 or the B1351 uh, variant that was first discovered in South Africa, both of which are gaining prevalence here, um, there's no evidence that, that they can get around the vaccine's ability to protect against severe disease. So I do think that if the pace of vaccination continues in the U.S., and if if President Biden is correct that by May 1st, every American who wants a vaccine will be able to get one on demand, uh, I think then we will be in good shape for, for starting to relax some of these precautions. But I, I completely want to emphasize, um, it is really important that right now, while we're still rolling out the vaccines and while we still don't have enough supply to vaccinate on demand, that people do keep up those mitigation measures because we have started to see cases tick up in some states And this is because we're really running a race between the variants, transmission, and how quickly we can vaccinate people. So hang on just a little bit longer, uh, continue to take those precautions. And the the more we do that now, the sooner we'll be able to open up and relax and have that be sustainable. On that issue, we've heard uh, the CDC director as well as Dr. Anthony Fauci talk about the concerns they have around the plateauing they've seen of the COVID uh, numbers. To what extent can we expect to see that dip even further uh, without kids getting vaccinated? Um, How how significant a piece is that part of all of this? If we're talking about returning to not just a new normal, but actually the normal we knew pre-pandemic. Well, so ultimately, long term, it's going to be very important to vaccinate children. I think that we can get back to a new normal before children are vaccinated. Um, And we've seen data from Israel that actually suggests that by vaccinating the majority of the adult population, you can drive transmission down and keep it there. The the issue with children is the same as with countries uh, that don't have the same access to vaccines. Children can definitely get infected with SARS coronavirus too. They can transmit it to others. And they're potentially uh, a population in which new variants could emerge. So long term, while it may not delay the the rate at which we can get back to quote unquote normal, um, it is going to be long term really important to vaccinate children to take away further opportunities for the virus to spread and for the virus to potentially mutate. Back to the the World Health Organization report, just as a final question to you, what are you looking, what do you think should be the sort of the next thing that we know or learn uh, out of their phase two? Because as you said in the beginning, we we kind of confirmed what was already known or was already suspected with this with this report today. Well, I think what we really need to do with phase two is to dig deeper into both the epidemiologic data um, to try to understand the circumstances under which this virus emerged. Uh, as well as continue to go out and and sample more wild animals. The the report discusses at length the fact that bats are are heavily oversampled because bats are known to carry these types of coronaviruses, but that doesn't exclude uh, that we may have missed an ancestral virus to SARS coronavirus 2 in another species. We already know that SARS coronavirus 2 can infect a number of other animals, including animals that are in close proximity to people, such as cats, Uh, such as some other animals that are farmed uh, in China for food or for fur. 
Um, so we really do need to expand our wildlife sampling efforts to try to find a more closely related beta coronavirus to SARS coronavirus 2. That will give us a lot more insight into the circumstances under which this virus emerged. In turn, that will give us some insight epidemic. All right, Dr. Rasmussen, uh, Georgetown Center for Global Health Science and Security Virologist alongside Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani. Appreciate you taking the time uh, to chat with us today.